Part 1 First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Hello, can I speak to... Uh, the advert doesn't give a name. Well, the name is Bob, and I guess this call is about the car I'm selling, right? Yes, my name's Francis, and I'm definitely interested. You'll like my car then. Clean, neat, nice. What sort is it? Oh, the original model was called an Echo. You know, like the Echo a sound can make. But then they changed the name to Yaris, just before I bought it. Yaris. I don't know why. I like the old name, and it's the same car, but that's what it's called. So, what's the colour? The ad says it's cream-coloured. Like cream, then? Yeah, well, it, it's more of a yellow colour, actually. Not cream? No, I don't know why I said that. It's like a canary, and small like one, too. So, what about the power? How many cylinders does it have? Four or six? My brother has a six-cylinder car and says it's very powerful. Well, this one's four only, but I find it fine for city driving. As long as you don't intend to drive this car interstate or across the country, it does the job fine. That's OK. I just want the car basically for commuting to work and maybe some weekend trips. Is it two-door or four-door? I suppose it's not four-door. The car's too small for that, right? Right. Just two doors, as you say. The front seat bends forward to allow entry into the rear. That's fine by me. This car is just for my girlfriend and I, anyway. Uh, what about accessories? Radio, CD player, anything else? Does it have an air conditioner? Well, no, it doesn't, but I don't find that a problem. I just open the window. I mean, if you really want, you can pay to have an AC installed. Basically, the only additional feature this car has is a radio, but it's still a great deal. That depends on the price. You say you want $12,800, right? Yep, about that. Well, obviously you expect the price to be reduced to an even figure, right? Well, I don't know. $12,000. $12,500, maybe. If you can lower it a bit, I'll come and have a look, OK? OK, OK. Let's say $12,400. But I won't lower it any more than that. Certainly not to $12,000. Well, if I can get that better price, I may come over this afternoon. But what year is this car? How old is it? My brother's got a 12-year-old car and it's showing problems. Well, my car was brand new only three years ago. But it still looks like it's only been one year on the road. OK. That sounds good. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Can I just ask a few more general questions about this car you're selling? Sure. Can you just tell me why you think it's such a good deal? Of course, I won't necessarily believe you, but just tell me what you think. You can believe me. I honestly think this is a nice car, well worth buying at the price I'm asking. How much rego registration does it have left? Oh, uh, to be honest, 
Not so much, but I think having lots of registration is irrelevant. It's the car you're paying for, the quality and advantages of the engine itself. Well, what about that then? OK, many people like to accelerate down the freeways, right? There are a lot of speed demons out there who think quickness is all that matters, but basically, people are mostly trapped in city traffic, so one of the things I like is that because this car is small, you can put it anywhere. Say you're in the city, wanting to duck into a shop. Well, you can fit this car in any little space while you go shopping or do other things, and that saves you a lot of time. Yeah, but it's not that powerful, right? Oh, sure, the feel of a smoothly purring six-cylinder engine attracts many people, but I compare my car to those small football players with the tight turning circles, those who can run rings around the larger players. This car is like that. It can turn this way and that way, dodge here, duck in there, sneak around corners, squeeze ahead, and grab a position. That's also very useful when travelling in city traffic. OK, I'll think about it. Sure, think about it. But all these advantages are sound and appeal to other buyers as well. No one holds the same car forever, so you can say exactly the same things that I just said when you want to sell the car. That will make it very easy for you to pass this car on to the next buyer. Yeah, maybe you're right. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a university administrator telling a group of new students about the central campus buildings and the facilities they provide. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Welcome everyone to the Brandon Complex, the geographical and, we could say, spiritual heart of this university. This is basically where everyone eats too, as you can see by looking around. There are many different cuisines here, Chinese, Indian and Middle Eastern, plus the usual fare of a local type, all in that corner over there. We have many shops here too, but the biggest is Wilson's, right there, providing clothing and hardware. That's next to all the restaurants. Now, on the opposite side of Wilson's we have three shops. The one in the corner there, closest to the restaurants, is for DVDs. Yes, the DVDs are cheap and affordable, and you can also rent DVD players as well. Moving on. In the corner directly opposite Wilson's is the Student Union office. Incidentally, you are all encouraged to join the Student Union, as a Student Union card gives you many benefits, including discounts on basically everything you can buy here at the Brandon Complex. Outside this complex, on the other side of the road, you can just see it from here in fact, is a building that we call by the rather unusual name, the H Building. Next to this, on the other side of some trees along the main road, is the Engineering Institute, but that doesn't have anything to do with the Brandon Complex. One last thing is that just outside this door, near us here, you can see a grassy oval patch. Well, that's the playing field for what we simply call the fitness room, which is alongside. So you can put on some calories here at the restaurants and then burn them off at the fitness room afterwards. Oh, I forgot to mention this shop right here, in the middle, 
beside the student union. It's the bookshop, and as you can see, it's always busy, always popular. You can buy newspapers, magazines, and stationery there, plus a few clothing items as well, just as you can at Wilson's. Why don't you go and take a look right now? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions seventeen to twenty. Now I'd like to tell you a bit more about one of the buildings here, namely the H building. Despite its bland name, you might be interested in what goes on there. It is our main recreational centre, with halls, offices, and space available for a variety of activities, mostly for those who want to get fit. For example. If you're interested in yoga, you're in luck, since four days a week there are free yoga classes. They have several levels, so if you're a beginner, you'd have to start with that. You can check the schedules on the wall there. Yoga used to be at night, but now it's in the mornings, but not on Wednesdays. Along those same lines, there's aerobic dancing in the afternoon. This shares the same room as the badminton games, which are on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. The aerobics are on the alternate days, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and it's not restricted at all. Everyone is welcome to join, although the instructor may divide you up, of course, according to ability. And just to show how diverse the H building is, there's even some spiritual solace available there. Inside the multi-denominational prayer center, with individual booths and a variety of holy scriptures and texts available to read from all the major religions of the world, that's open all day over the weekend, but not at night time when the rooms are for private booking. Finally, for those of you of a cerebral nature, the university chess club operates at night. That's open from eight p.m. Every、uh, is it Wednesday or Monday? No, sorry, Friday, and I think it closes at about eleven thirty p.m. So there's something for everyone in the H building. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students, Dylan and Emily, discussing a presentation which they will have to make. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Okay, Emily. As you know, we've got to do this presentation together. I know. I'm a little bit nervous about it, standing up in front of all those people. And what if the presentation fails? What if? Don't worry. I've been reading a book about giving effective presentations. It's not that hard, but the way to do it is certainly not always obvious either. For example, do you know what the most important part of a presentation is? The final summary, I guess. The opposite. 
the first minute in fact, the theory says that that first minute is when you win or lose the audience. If you lose them at that point, you'll probably never get them back. So that's why you need a hook. A hook? You mean like when you catch fish? Yes. I mean, not exactly, but yes, we want to catch the audience, right? So we need to start in a way which wakes them up, gets them interested, and makes them watch us. I see. Basically, no matter how good our presentation is, if the message doesn't get across, the presentation fails. So we need to give a fact which really amazes them, or an interesting story, or pose a dilemma which makes them think, something they can really puzzle over. It's better if this is related to the subject, of course, something to do with management in our case. So that's the hook. That's right. From then on, we'll just follow the basic advice. Like what? Like talk to your audience, you know, as equals. Don't talk down to them or up to them. They're just the same as us, right? You're right. You know, some of the best presentations I've ever seen sounded just like conversations. Exactly. And what else made them good? Well, the speakers sort of involved me in the topic and issues under discussion by asking questions, by、uh, referring to me. You know, by saying you and well, basically they were interesting. And they're exactly the tips we'll follow too. It should be fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Emily, I think this will be a fine presentation, but how are we going to divide it up? For example, who's going to open it? You or me? Well, I think you have a very natural style, so you should start. This talk has five main parts, so you can introduce it and then do part one. That's the historical context or background to the issue. Yes, then I'll do part two about current views. You do part three, and I'll do part four, leaving both of us to handle the question time. I'm okay with that. In part one, I'll probably speak at length about Hoffman's theory about management styles and compare differences in culture in relation to the style of management used. That sounds good. Those differences are important and certainly relevant to the current times. Hoffman makes some excellent points too on this issue. That's why I'll follow up with present-day perspectives and viewpoints on this, such as the problems facing today's managers in the complex multicultural workplace, where basically one can no longer assume one is dealing with a single culture in the workplace, but actually a multiculture. That sounds good, also. Then I'll take over discussing the implications and problems of this. I suppose you'll look at the pluralist movement. Yeah, I was thinking about that, but then I changed my mind. I've decided I'll look at the productive diversity argument. It's more interesting anyway, so I'll go with that. Then I'll tell everyone what we've decided is the best business practice, or what is most likely to work in most situations, which is basically ignoring pluralism and productive diversity, and linking everything back to Cotter's theory of human universals. Yes, the theory that argues modern management should target the universals of human nature. Right, and that leaves both of us to field questions at the end. Are there any questions we can predict so that we have some good answers ready about resolving industrial disputes, for example? Well, I'd say that industrial democracy usually surprises people, so we should expect a lot of questions about that. Yes, the theory is that it increases productivity and reduces industrial delays, and results in better decision making. But that's all theory. Most people would think that industrial democracy is just about unworkable in practice. So let's be ready to explore that issue in some depth, as well as any other related topics. Okay? Okay.
That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer discussing the possibility of creating nuclear fusion. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. We look at the sun, a huge ball streaming out essentially limitless energy into space, and we think about how we need that energy here on Earth. Our oil reserves are running out, coal burning causes much pollution, and nuclear energy has many dangers. But where does the sun itself get its energy? The answer is that the sun makes it using fusion or, more specifically, in a hydrogen fusion process. There is no pollution, no radioactivity, no waste products, and we have plenty of hydrogen. So, hydrogen fusion seems the perfect answer to our energy needs, and scientists have long attempted to achieve it here on Earth. So what happens during this process? The first step is to make two light atomic particles approach. In the case of our sun, these are hydrogen particles, the lightest and also the easiest to deal with. However, the problem is that the nuclei of atoms have electric fields and fusion between these particles is opposed by their similar electric charge. They most naturally repel each other and the nuclei of all elements are exactly the same in this respect. Thus, in order to overcome this repulsion and force them together, in the second step, the particles are heated. The trouble is, you need a lot of heat, incredible temperatures of the sort only seen on the surface of the sun. This is many millions of degrees, far higher than the melting point of any known material. Still, the concept is simple. The hot, wildly moving particles, which are now called plasma, will crash into each other, resulting in the third step the fusion into helium, which releases energy and begins a self-sustained process. So, we know how fusion works. Thus, the big question is, can we create it here on Earth? We actually have the technology to superheat hydrogen into plasma, but no container on Earth can deal with those temperatures. Thus, we need to confine this superheated material so that it doesn't touch anything. For that, we need a special reactor, and most research has focused on an apparatus known as a tokamak system. That's T-O-K-A-M-A-K, -A -A an acronym from some Russian words meaning toroidal chamber with magnetic field. It's an apt name, since a very powerful magnetic field is used to confine and suspend the super-hot plasma in the air so that it doesn't touch anything. This is possible only because this plasma has an electric charge, which interacts with the magnetic field. Of course, the walls of the fusion vessel will still get hot, very hot, and to avoid being melted, they must be cooled with a cryogenic system to intensely low temperatures. But now we are faced with the second problem. If we are to draw power from this system, the reaction must be continuous and controllable. However, when fusion begins, the plasma becomes unstable, and at these temperatures, that is a very serious situation. If we lose control, a disaster could result. Despite the obstacles, in 2010, a European device managed some success 
but needed far more power to generate the fusion reaction than that produced from the fusion itself. Obviously then, it was not useful as a power source. More to the point, this system could only sustain a fusion reaction for a fraction of a second, yet to self-sustain, the fusion needs to run for at least 10 seconds. And the future looks bleak. Unfortunately, most scientists predict that many decades will have to pass before fusion power can become a practical reality. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.